provide some context for Psalm 96. Um, you can read about where Psalm 96 was originally sung, um, and that's in 1 Chronicles, or given to us in 1 Chronicles 15 and 16. Um, we're not going to read both chapters because they're long, but we're going to pick a f- some verses from them and read through them, and uh, Pastor Winston talks about them in his sermon as well. So uh, first we'll read the verses 1 through 3, and then we'll read uh, starting at verse 25. 1 Chronicles 15, verse 1. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, for the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. And then he appoints a bunch of different people to help with all the preparations and the music especially. And then in verse 25, we continue reading, So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And because God helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as also were all the Levites who were carrying the Ark, and the singers and Shaniah, the, son, the leader of the music of the singers, and David wore a linen ephod. So all of Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn, trumpets and cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. And as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the Ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it, And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were Zechariah, Jael, Shemaramoth, Jael, Mattatiah, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. And then follows a couple different psalms. In them is Psalm 96, and then end of verse 36, then all the people said amen and praise the Lord. So the video will start playing uh, in a minute here, and Pastor Bosch will read Psalm 96 with us, and he'll also close in prayer. And after the video, we'll sing from the Psalm 96, the stanzas 1, 2, and 8. Let's read together Psalm 96. Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. And he will judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. This is God's holy word. And this is a psalm. And psalms are meant to be sung. And so we're going to sing this psalm in its entirety after this sermon. And so really, the, 
I sort of think of the purpose of my sermon when I'm preaching on a psalm is to help you sing it well. I want us to meditate on this psalm now together so that after this sermon you can sing it in a really robust and full way. Psalm 1 tells us to meditate on the psalms. And Psalm 2 tells us to worship the king, that is, King Jesus. And so we want to meditate on Psalm 96 and also see Jesus in this psalm so that after the sermon we can sing the psalm and sing it rightly. The very first line of this psalm says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a... Sorry. O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord a new song. So that's an expression that you find uh, numerous places in the Psalms. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to sing a brand new psalm that you've never sung before. It can mean sing some old and ancient truths with new and fresh enthusiasm. It's sort of like if you've Uh, you know, you haven't heard a song, a popular song that you used to really like when you were younger, perhaps, and you haven't heard it for a long time, and it comes on, and it puts a big smile on your face, and it gets you dancing in the kitchen. You're like, whoa, this is great. It seems new to you, and so you sing it or you dance with it with some fresh enthusiasm. And so that's the kind of thing that we we ought to do with this psalm here today. This psalm is going to teach us some really ancient truths. It's It's in some ways a blast from the past, And we need to meditate on it, see Jesus in it, and then sing it with new, fresh enthusiasm. So the theme of this sermon is simply this. Sing a new song. And then I would like to meditate on three things. Highlight three things amongst all of the things we could talk about in the psalm. I'd like to talk about worship, mission, and then equity. Worship, mission, and equity. Let's sing a new song to the Lord. So, first of all, worship. It's really obvious that this is a this is a worship psalm, isn't it? This is a psalm that's just full of exuberant, excited, boiling over, fresh, enthusiastic worship. And so you get the, the psalmist, he's, he's using repetition to reinforce this, uh, this case. So verse 1 and 2, you hear the repetition of the word sing. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. And then if you get to verses 7 through 8, he uses uh, the word ascribe. So ascribe to the Lord, O families and peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory, do his name. And then verse 9, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. This is a worship psalm. Sing, sing, sing. Ascribe, ascribe, ascribe. Worship the Lord together in the splendor of his holiness. The psalmist wants us to, he wants to help us worship with some real fresh enthusiasm. He wants us to hallow the name of God and to lift God's name up and to worship him and and to to adore him for his majesty. And so this psalm, it doesn't have a title in in the book of Psalms. You could use this psalm for any occasion. But it is a psalm that's associated with a with a historical context. And I'm saying that carefully because 1 Corinthians 15 and 16, which we read, um tells the story about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. And then in chapter 16, there's this mix of Psalm 196 with some other psalms. It's not entirely clear if that is the one they sang at that moment, but it is certainly associated with that event, and so we do well to think about it in terms of that. So David, is, um, he's established Jerusalem as the capital city of his kingdom, And he brings the Ark of the Covenant, which has been at Obed-Edom's house. He brings it into Jerusalem. And this is a really big deal. So the, the, the king anointed by God is on the throne. And now they're going to bring the central element of God's worship, the Ark of the Covenant of God, into, the tem- uh, into Jerusalem, where David has pitched a tent. You can sort of imagine he's got all the building materials stacked up. His son is going to build the temple. And so he's, he's bringing this into Jerusalem, and it's this huge deal. It's this huge deal. He's got You know, everybody important that you can imagine is involved. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says that all of Israel is bringing the ark into Jerusalem. This is, it's, well, it's a gigantic big party. And at the same time, it's a huge worship service because they're worshiping the ark. The fact that the ark of the covenant, which is the presence of God with his people, right? The ark of the covenant is where God uh, manifests himself in the tabernacle. That's coming into the city, and so as they celebrate the presence of God, they have this huge worship service. There are choirs galore. 
There are choirs and, and singers and people running those choirs. And we know from the text that there's all kinds of musicians. And there are horns and trumpets and cymbals and harps and lyres. And 1 Corinthians 15 says that they played that very loudly. Now, sometimes when the pastor preaches, and he preaches very loudly, I see some little kids go like this. Well, if you were in Jerusalem that day, and all of these horns and trumpets and cymbals and harps and lyres and musicians and choirs were singing, it would have been so loud that you would have gone like this. It was just so loud. You maybe would have had to wear earmuffs. It's like all the musicians turned their amp all the way up to the maximum setting and started playing their guitar. Loud, loud music. And, the, and, and this, this beautiful worship service, as it's described in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles, sorry, and in Psalm 96, it's, it's got two sort of elements to it. Now, two weeks ago, I, I had a, a catechism class where I had the senior and the junior students together. And uh, we decided that we weren't really going to study the catechism that night. Instead, we had sort of a fun games night, and we played... Uh, sardines in here, and we played all kinds of games, and then I had snacks. And so I told the kids that if they wanted a snack, they would have to either tell a joke or they had to give an impression of Pastor Winston. And one person, not to mention any Callums, um, <laughs> said, immediately stood up to give his impression, and he said, now we have to move from the horizontal to the vertical. <laughs> Which is something that I tend to repeat a fair bit, apparently. Well, this is the horizontal and the vertical column. This is what was going on in this worship service. And you can see it in the psalm here because there's, there's this reverent, trembling worship of God. That's the vertical. This reverent, trembling worship of God is there. They're worshiping the presence of God with the ark coming into Jerusalem. And then at the same time, there's this whole horizontal element to it as they're singing not just with each other to God, but to each other and playing music with each other and they're dancing with each other. And they're also eating a lot of food together, which is one of my favorite parts of that text. They're basically having, um, they're having a barbecue and they're eating lots of bread and, and raisin bread. So it's got this vertical element and this horizontal element. It's this... It's a worship service, but boy, oh boy, is it a big party at the same time. It's really something else. And so when we say, you know, what we do here together on a Sunday, we call it a worship service. In French, we call it a celebration, a celebration. And so that's really what you can see was going on in this worship service and what Psalm 96 is all about. It's about a fresh, wonderful celebration. It's celebratory worship. And that's what Psalm 96 is calling us to do something else. Don't you wish you could have been there? Some of you will, uh, will know Garrison Keillor. Garrison Keillor is a radio personality from, uh, from the United States. He created the, the Minnesota Public Radio, and he had this long-running radio show called News from Lake Wabigon. And news from Lake Wabigon was just stories that happened in Lake Wabigon. And most of the inhabitants of Lake Wabigon, this, this, this fictional place, they were Scandinavian Lutherans. Scandinavian Lutherans. And Scandinavian Lutherans, Northern Europeans, a little bit like Dutch Reformed people, and Scandinavian Lutherans in Lake Wabigon, they were sort of emotionally conservative. Not very expressive with their emotions, put, keep things close to their chest, you know, not, don't get too excited about things. Um, a bit like the way I grew up. And so there's this one boy in, in Wabigan. He has a dream one day. He, he belongs to this Scandinavian Lutheran family. And he has a dream one day that he was born into a Spanish Roman Catholic family. Where there's big goblets of red wine and rich oil paintings and loud discussion and music and dancing and all of those expressive type things. And he has this dream that this, this sort of happens. Well, when, when I first heard that story, I kind of thought to myself, yeah, you know, like, I come, I got, I got raised in sort of the emotionally conservative Dutch reform background, and sometimes I have a dream that I belong to, like, the, the Jewish Jerusalemites, uh, Jerusalemites of Psalm 96 who really know how to party and celebrate during a worship service with really loud music and dancing and barbecue and raisin bread. And, and I think what that, 
what that shows is that oftentimes, if you're, if you're a Christian, you sort of look, you look at the other side of the fence and you think, well, the grass is greener in other Christian traditions or in other, you know, other churches in terms of their worship, in terms of their worship. But Psalm 96, the, the, this psalm is not, is not a worship psalm that tries to say what you need to do is you need to replicate how the ancient Jews worshipped. Every culture, every church tradition has strengths and weaknesses when it comes to how it worships. Our tradition here at Jubilee has strengths and it has weaknesses. And so we ought not to be too hard on our own worship tradition because the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. It's easy to pick out the weaknesses of your own upbringing and your own tradition than it is sometimes to appreciate all the good things about it. And then, of course, on the flip side, you ought not to be also so stuck in your own worship tradition that you can't learn or you can't improve upon or recognize that culture changes and things change. The, the goal that, uh, that we ought to have is to sing a new song. And that doesn't mean that we have to remake everything new, but we ought to try to worship with freshness and with enthusiasm where God has placed us. And so let me give you, by way of application, one really easy way that you can do that. All right? Because we could talk about all, you know, how we, could we improve worship in our church? Well, that's a good discussion to have. But here's one really easy thing. I had a conversation recently with, with Mr. Kent Dykstra. Some of you will know him. He runs the Reform String Camp. And Tim Newenhouse, who's a church musician from uh, down in the, in the Golden Horseshoe. And the question was asked, uh, what do you think is most distinctive about Canadian Reformed worship? And their answer was, what do you think it was? There's, they said that the most distinctive thing about Canadian Reformed worship is, that, is our singing, that we actually sing. And so they, they both gave examples of visiting other churches, other communities, where worship tends to be listening to musicians play and, and, and vocalists sing, but the congregation doesn't really sing. Or maybe it mumbles along a little bit. And so they were both insistent that what we really need to keep is to keep our singing. Robust congregational singing is a, is a strength and a distinctive that we don't want to let go. And so if we're looking at for application from Psalm 96 on how to sing, 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 then I suggest that what you do is sing. And that I suggest that what you do in church is you sing louder than you currently do. How's that for an application? All right? Now, some of you are sitting beside somebody who already sings really loud, and you're wondering, do I really want that person to sing louder? <laughs> but let's sing. You know, I, I know what it's like in church. You'd be like, oh, sometimes, sometimes you're like into it, and sometimes you're like, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, sometimes you took a video of people singing, you know, and took the sound off. You wouldn't know if they were just speaking or singing. Why not say, well, let's sing, sing, sing. Let's sing. Let's sing loudly. Let's let's. You know, take that strength and, and expand on it. And then I would say, um, try to do that in your homes too. You know, my, my home is not very musical. You know, I, I look back, I wish we would have done more singing as a family when, than when they were younger. You know, my brother always told me, he said, oh, it's hard to be angry with each other as, as, uh, as a family if you sing together. It's sing. Sing loudly in your homes and then especially at church. And then after you've mastered that, well, if you want to add some dancing and some barbecue and some raisin bread, be my guest, as long as you give me some of the raisin bread. All right, this is a, this is a worship psalm. This is a worship psalm. Let's worship the Lord. Sing, sing, sing. Ascribe, ascribe, ascribe. Let's worship him. In the second place, this is also a song that is so deeply about mission. And worship and mission are so connected. What's going on? David is bringing the ark into the, into the city of Jerusalem. God is coming into Jerusalem, and all of the people exalt the Lord, and they give exuberant, loud worship that has a distinctive missionary flavor to it. And so senior catechism students who have been talking about the covenant a lot will recognize that that really what's going on here is they understand that the Abra covenant with Abraham was that God would bless the people of God so that they would bless the whole world. 
right? That the, from the beginning, God's covenant relationship with his people had a worldwide missionary focus. And so here we have God, uh, the ark of God coming into Jerusalem, and so they worship with a missionary focus. When God's presence fills Jerusalem, what you have is covenant faithfulness expressed in fresh missionary worship. And it's all throughout this psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord who? All the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory where? Among the nations. His marvelous works where? Among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all other gods because the gods of the peoples are worthless. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are his. Strength and beauty is his. Now you hit the ascribes. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to him glory, do his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship him in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him. Who has to tremble before him? All of the earth. You see the missionary focus? Verse 10, say among the nations. It doesn't say just say among the congregations. Say among the whole nations, the Lord reigns. And he's coming to judge the peoples. He's coming to judge all. All of the earth. And then verse 11, it's like the psalmist is just getting cranked up here. And he's been talking about all the peoples of the earth. And now he wants to get all of creation to join in it. So the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. The sea roar, all that fills in it. The field exalts, exalts everything in it. Everything in the created world is being called to worship the Lord as the Lord comes to judge the earth in righteousness and in faithfulness. In verse 2, right at the beginning, as I read, it said, tell of his salvation from day to day. The ancient Greek translation of this psalm, the Septuagint, which is what the New Testament writers used as a translation, translates the word tell in Greek with the word evangelize. This is a psalm that instructs the people of God in the middle of their exuberant worship to evangelize the nations. And so as a church... We never, ever want to put our Sunday worship and the mission of the church to the world in competition with each other or or as, as sort of two different things that are unrelated. It's never one or the other. And they, they're always integrated. They're never isolated. You never think of worship and mission as two distinct things. You want to think about them together because the goal of mission is what? It's worship. The goal of mission is to get all of the world to join you in worshiping God. And so they're, they're tightly tied together. Now, the day will come when all the world will worship and mission will be done for. So if you're a missionary, one day you can be out of a job. But if you're a worshiper, that keeps on going. One day the whole world will worship and mission will no longer be needed. But to quote Aragon, today is not that day. Today is not that day. In our day, mission and worship remain two sides of the same coin. And you can see that when you look at Psalm 96, because all of the reasons for worship and the reasons for mission are the same. So you've got verse 1 and 2, which speaks about tell of his salvation from day to day. So for the Old Testament people, they're probably remembering the Lord who saved them out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, as you read as an introduction to the law today, and the Lord saving them from all of their enemies throughout time. But today as New Christian, as New Testament Christians, we recognize that this salvation is salvation from sin and from the power of the devil, salvation by Jesus who removes our guilt and our shame. And so we are saved, and so we worship the Lord, and we call other people to come and enjoy that salvation in Jesus Christ. In verse 3, it says, you know, praise the Lord for his marvelous works. So all of the good things that you see in the world come to us from the Father of lights. And so you can think about anything and everything that you find amazing and beautiful and wonderful and cool in the world, and you praise God for that as well as all of the stuff that you look through history and see the hand of God working throughout history, and you praise God for that, and you call other people and say, check out this cool stuff that God does. Look at all of this amazing thing that God does. You praise him for it, and you invite other people into it in mission. In verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, it talks about how God is great 
in the verse 5, it talks about how he made the heavens. God is the creator of the universe. He holds everything in his hands. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's the awesome creator. And so the, the awesome nature of the created world brings us to praise him and to bring others into that praise. And so we praise him for distant stars, and we praise him for F1 racing. And we praise him for tulips coming out of the ground, and we praise him for tuning forks. And we praise him for, for radios, and we praise him for raisin bread. Sort of the theme of the sermon today, isn't it, raisin bread? You praise the Lord for all of these amazing, beautiful things because he's great and he's created it all. And he's created, the New Testament says, through Jesus. And so you're praising Jesus for all of these things. And you're telling people to come and say, look at all this amazing stuff. Look how great our creator God is. It's incredible. And you hit verse 4 and 5. It talks about the worthless idols. There's a little bit of cool Hebrew wordplay going on in here with worthless idols. So it says, you know, the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, and and gods there is Elohe, and then worthless idols is just one word. It just means worthless. It's Elohim. So it's the Elohe or Elohim. The Elohe or Elohim. It's sort of, in English, we would probably say something like, the gods of the peoples are garbage. The gods are garbage. The gods are garbage. And, And that's true because, frankly, there's a lot of garbage ways to live in this world. There's a lot of a lot of really rubbish ways to, to go about living your life. And it's worthless. It's garbage. And instead, there's this beautiful and meaningful and true way of living in the world where Christ is your Savior and you have been freed from all of those life-dominating things, all of those idols, so that you want to praise God and invite other people to, away from their worthless idols to praise God with you. Worship and mission are all tied in together. The reasons are all the same. And then verse 6 through 9 mentions splendor, majesty, strength, beauty, glory, strength, glory be to his name, splendor of his holiness. It's all this this wonderful language about God's attractiveness and his worthwhileness and how he's so interesting and how God is not something that's fearful or grotesque or something that's unpleasant, but that God is beautiful in all who he is and all that he does. And every once in a while... When you're thinking about God's grace, for example, for the love of God for you despite your weaknesses and how the Lord takes your shame away from you and you really meditate on that and perhaps talk to somebody about that, then you sort of get choked up a little bit perhaps, even if you're emotionally conservative because you recognize how beautiful the gospel is, how wonderful it is. And how God truly is a beautiful God in the splendor of his holiness. And it makes you want to praise him and pray to him and sing to him and invite some other people to join you because worship and mission always go together. And then in verse 10 and verse 13, there's there's this one big reason to worship God and to do mission, and this is one that I I would like to focus on as the third point of our sermon about equity. So verse 10 says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it will never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And in verse 13, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness, and it's the peoples in faithfulness. So, First of all, you have to recognize that this is not just some sort of theological truism. We're going to explain what equity is in a moment. But this, is not, this text is not just saying something that's like a theological statement. Like, God will judge the people, and he will do that with equity. You have to think about it in context. God, you know, with the ark, is entering the city of Jerusalem, and its inhabitants, the people of Israel, are saying, God has arrived you know, uh, you know, with the ark, and now he is going to reign over us, and he's going to judge us with equity. This is going to happen here in Jerusalem. And so if you read, we read 1 Chronicles 15 and 16. If you go to 1 Chronicles 18, verse 14, it says this. It concludes the whole story by saying, So David reigned over all Israel, and he administered justice and equity to all the people. So God enters Jerusalem, and then his anointed messianic king, King David, now rules 
as God's representative with justice and equity. When God's presence fills Jerusalem, there's covenant faithfulness expressed in fresh missionary worship and equity. So let's talk about what equity is then. So equity, if uh, you're into finance, is a company's total assets minus the company's total liabilities. That's not what this equity is about. Equity here is a word you can sort of hear the word equal in it. And equity there is the quality of being fair, impartial, not showing favoritism, being just. And so when the Bible speaks in all kinds of places about fairness and justice and impartiality, not showing favoritism, it's speaking about equity. It's the quality of God that when he judges the earth, he does it with fairness. And he doesn't show favoritism. And he does it in a just way. And Psalm 96 is part of a, a collection of psalms that are grouped together that have this sort of as a theme. So um, in Psalm 97, in verse 2, it says, Cloud and thick darkness all are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. It's righteousness and justice. Or righteousness and equity. Psalm 98, uh, verse 9 says, the Lord comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And in Psalm 99, verses 1 through 5, The Lord reigns. Let all the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, you know, between the cherubim, on the ark. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, in Jerusalem. He's exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And so it's this, this group of psalms that are proclaiming the good news. And the good news is that the Lord is going to judge the earth. And the Lord is going to be fair. And he's going to be just. And he's not going to show favoritism. And he's not going to take bribes. He's going to judge with equity. This is the good news that the people of Israel is to proclaim to the nations. And that makes a lot of sense if you, if you read through the Old Testament and you realize how many stories there are in the Old Testament of people being unjustly discriminated against. Specifically the poor, people who live on the fringes of society, people who are marginalized, people who don't have power and money and can't stand up to kings and princes and Women and children in hardship, widows and orphans. There's all kinds of stories about injustice, wrong things that happen to people, not because of their fault, but wrong things that happen to them. And so there's this hope in the Old Testament. There's this hope that God will come and he's going to be a different kind of judge. He's going to judge with equity. And that's good news for people who are suffering injustice. Now, I, I worked for five years in West Africa, and I would have lots of people who would end up asking me, so what do you think is you know, the one thing that Africa needs? Well, I don't know what the one thing Africa needs. Africa's a big place. But I got a little bit of experience in one country, in West Africa, and you can't simplify things by just picking one thing. But if there was one thing, if I could have a magic wand and change one thing in the country of Mali that I worked in, I would say that there would be the equitable rule of law that there would be rule of law by the authorities that was fair and just, that people could count on it. Because you just saw how there was so much nepotism and favoritism and then vengeance and total injustice and inconsistency. And so people would be, you'd be afraid to start a business because you didn't know what was going to happen when you registered it and you didn't know if, you know, maybe that judge's brother is going to steal from you. And, and you know, all kinds of, you know, corruption and mix-up and nobody knew, nobody could trust whether the police were going to actually give, be fair. And nobody could trust if the judge was going to judge fairly and equitably, maybe, you, you know, you, unless you had to bribe them or, or, you know, or maybe you had to bribe them. I had somebody who said, um, you know, the problem with elections is that you don't know who's going to win, so you don't know who, who to vote for. Because you really want to vote for the person who's going to win, because otherwise you might get in trouble. So, like, this is weird, weird way of thinking, but it's because you can't depend on anything. There's no equity. And I remember with a bunch of, a bunch of my, my Malian colleagues, I, uh, I was chatting with them once, and I was like, well, do you guys have any stories about injustice in your own life? So what would happen if I asked you guys that? 
like, could you raise your hand, tell me a story where, of injustice, personal injustice in your own life. Some of you would be able to put up your hand. But in Mali, it was like everybody had a story. Everybody had a story about how they got cheated out of something or they got, you know, there was some injustice that was inflicted upon them by those who held power or those who, you know, had more money than them or, you know, whoever that may be. Everybody had a story. And so the idea that you could have someone reign with equity sounded like amazing good news. And it still is good news. It's what the world needs. And I think that it's also not just something that, that far-off places in other continents need needs. It's also something that we continue to need today right where we are. Equity is important also in the city of Ottawa and in the country of Canada. Now, equity and inclusivity have become sort of buzzwords and popular terms in our, in our culture today. And so you could be excused if I say the word equity and inclusivity and you sort of eye roll because those buzzwords have been used by some cultural elites as a buzz saw in order to take out people they disagree with. And equity and inclusivity and all of the, the sort of the woke jargon that happens in the world today is often used to rip things down rather than to build things up. And it's often used not to make peace, but used as a weapon in order to further other people's agendas. That being said, you have to be careful not to lose sight that the, the modern impulse also in Canada, the impulse toward equity, is a good one. The impulse toward equity is a good one. In fact, I would say that it's a fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in that much of our society today enjoys the fruits of the gospel, even though if you sort of imagine, or you could say the flowers of the gospel, even if our society has cut the stems away from the root of Christ. And so the focus on fairness and the focus on, on treating people in equal ways is a beautiful impulse. It's, it's a good thing. We happen to live in one of the most equitable societies that has ever existed in all of human history. And the reason for that is because we live in a country that traces its roots down to Christendom. Now, those flowers that we see blossoming, this, this modern impulse for equity and for fairness, they've been cut from the root of Christ, which means that they will wilt. As you can also already see them beginning to wilt or to deform and to be used in, in odd and bad ways. And so we as the church continue to need to, to preach and to proclaim and announce and celebrate the good news that God comes to judge the world in equity and in favor, in, in, in fairness. And there are a lot of people today that need and desire and long for still today in our country to be treated fairly for once, to be treated equitably because they aren't. I spoke to a pastor the other day who has um, a couple in his church, and they, um, they both had individual ac accidents a couple months apart, and they're both now disabled and unable to work. Um, they're engaged to be married, and they both receive government pensions because they're unable to work. And together with their two pensions, they can afford to put a down payment on a house. The problem is, is the moment they get married, one of their pensions disappears and then they won't be able to afford payments on their house. And there's no way for them to work around that. They're not being treated fairly. They're a victim of a system where they're, they're not being treated equitably. And so this pastor's trying to think about, well, could we just celebrate the marriage in the church and not tell the government about it so that they can be married and still receive the pension that they need in order to survive? There are people that desperately need to be treated fairly. Visit, for instance, one of the, the numerous homes in our city that are housing mums and their children who have been fleeing abusive husbands and abusive fathers and understand how difficult it is for them to be able to move forward. Or talk to the father who, by no fault of his own, now has no access to his own children because of a system that has barred or pushed him out of it. We got a couple of families in our church that are involved in foster care. What an amazing thing to live in a country that, that has got government departments that, that 
tried to help people foster children. But if you talk to those parents at our church, man, oh man, there is a whole lot of injustice and, and lack of fairness that happens also for those individual kids. Do I need to mention the unborn? Not exactly getting a fair shot at it, are they? We need equity. We need God to come and judge the peoples with fairness, also the unborn. I don't know how many of you, uh, some of you live in Gatineau. Are any of you still under a, a, a water boiling advisory? No? I, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> you don't know. You've just been drinking the water. <laughs> uh, you know, earlier this year, there's, there's a whole uh, you know, 15,000 people, people in, in, in Gatineau that had to boil their water. If you head out toward Eganville, uh, you can visit the Algonquin of the Pekawakanagan First Nation. And that First Nation has had a water boil advisory for the last 20 years. Well, th those things are complicated, but what's going on? We have people that desire equity, and you don't have to look far around the world to see it too. All of us who are enjoying or you know, looking forward to enjoying the World Cup understand that the World Cup stadiums in Qatar are being built by enslaved workers who are not being treated fairly. And I can tell you that there is also people in our church who have really suffered injustice. People in our congregation who have been accu uh, uh, accused unjustly and falsely of things that they didn't do and have suffered for them. People who have been treated unfairly by loved ones, by employers, people who have been shunned, people who have experienced bullying and racism and sexism and ageism and abuse at the hands of those more powerful. And the world groans and it cries out for fairness, for justice, for equity. And so the missionary church of Jesus Christ proclaims the hope of the reign of Jesus by asking all of creation and saying, Say to the nations, the Lord reigns, the world is established, it shall not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And so let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, and it's a good news that we and the world around us still needs to hear. When God's presence comes into Jerusalem, it's covenant faithfulness expressed in fresh missionary worship and equity under God's appointed king, King David. When the Holy Spirit descends upon the church at Pentecost, we see covenantal faithfulness expressed in fresh missionary worship and a church that acts with equity, sharing their goods amongst each other with no partiality, masters and slaves eating at the same Lord's Supper table. And as the church of Christ today gathers on a Sunday, what we aim for is covenantal faithfulness expressed in fresh missionary worship and lives lived with equity promoting social justice. James says it well, my brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So Psalm 96 as we meditate, it on, meditate on it, asks us to hold three things together. It asks us to hold fresh worship of the triune God. Fresh worship of God who deserves all the glory and all the praise. That's the first thing. Then it also asks us to have missionary enthusiasm to see the peoples of the world converted from their worthless idols to faith in Jesus Christ alone. The worship of God and the missionary outreach so that people leave worthless idols and worship and put their faith in Christ alone and in a commitment to equity and social justice for those who are discriminated against. It asks us to hold those three things together. I think that if you have a church that is able to do that, holds worship of God, the exclusive call to Faith in Christ is the only way to God. Abandon your worthless idols. And at the same time, a dedication to equity. A church like that is very difficult to pin down. It's very difficult to stick in a box. 
It's very difficult for people, whether you're on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the spectrum or somewhere in between, to pinpoint and say, you're this or you're that. And the reason that is the case is because when you are committed to this psalm, if you're committed to the worship of God and missionary enthusiasm to call people to Christ and to equity, then you're not marching to the drumbeat of the world. And you're also not marching to some drumbeat of some particular evangelical tradition of Christianity. But what you're doing is you're singing a new song to the tune of Scripture. And you're singing a new song following the heartbeat of Jesus. And the world doesn't know what to do with that. But I think it'll be attracted to it. And let me finish with this. Whatever you do, don't, don't pin your hopes on people that are doing this or churches that are doing this. 1 Chronicles 18 says, So David reigned over all of Israel and administered justice and equity for all the people. But we also know some of the other stuff that David did. When he forced himself on Bathsheba and killed her husband, and failed to give justice to his daughter Tamar. David, in the end, failed to administer justice and equity. That fact pointed the people to their need for a new kind of king, a different kind of savior. And if you go through church history, you'll see, you'll see churches and Christians making valiant efforts but failing again and again as they fail to, to worship God, fail to call others to true faith, and fail to practice equity in the world. But this Psalm 96 doesn't call us to put our faith in people or in princes or in kings or in church leaders because God knows those things lead you to disappointment. And so, yes, we need to do our best. We need to try also in this church to show no partiality as we hold on to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And we want to strive to make our church a place of fairness and a place of justice and to live our lives in the world as such. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, please put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. We think of these words from Isaiah that we often read around Christmas. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is Jesus. And the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide, decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the world. So put your faith and your hope in Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus and keep on seeing fresh, new, enthusiastic psalms and songs to Jesus and hold out the hope of Jesus who reigns with equity to the watching world. Brothers and sisters, sing a new song. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, Father in heaven, give us your grace and the power of your spirit so we can just do that. Sing loudly a new song in wholehearted worship and to sing loudly a new song of courageous mission and to sing loudly a new song of faithful equity. In all these things, please, O oh Lord, conform us to your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.